So I'm, I've got a, a topic which is slightly different from everyone else's. And I told Aung Kun that maybe everyone's tired of listening to burnout or resilience in the same old words. And the words that I tend to pronounce quite a bit in the role that I have. And um, I was trying to, to pay attention uh, as, as well as I could to everyone's presentation today. And those words cropped up about how COVID has impacted us in the world of healthcare and our students as well. And um, amongst our healthcare professionals, it's not just those in the front line, but equally those in admin roles as well. Plus that sense of loss that people weren't coming back to the offices as well. Um, there's been quite a lot said about that. Um, I do have to make a disclaimer and apology at about 9.20 this morning. Uh, someone very prominent in HR called me and said, um, you know, the um, IT security and data protection modules, we're going to cut your IT <laughs> if you don't finish it. And I said, well, I had trouble getting in and uh, I will have another look at it. And um, I was terrified because I didn't want to have any disruptions to, to this afternoon's presentation. The long story short is I tried to do it whilst I was trying to listen this morning as well. And it went on for about nearly two and a half hours, plus going downstairs to collect the food. And I was actually thinking to myself, the greatest thing about the arts and the humanities is it gives us something to look forward to, something to rejoice about in the midst of the madness that we face every day, I think. Um, and that sort of curiosity, that, that sort of joy that we get, I think that uplifts us um, when things are sort of pretty crazy. I must say that I did fail twice because I think one of the questions um, in this test that I was doing whilst listening. So multitasking is definitely um, not something I can achieve or be proud of. Um, but having, having done all that and they have not cut my IT, I'm very happy to be my, my internet and everything else. I'm very happy to be with you today. The other thing I wanted to say was um, when Lalit spoke earlier on, he mentioned that Prof. Cynthia Go had passed away yesterday. Um, I wasn't aware of that. Uh, I, I, um, I think June last year was invited to do a presentation on empathy in healthcare. It was a lunch um, setting or, or webinar. And I thought, you know, maybe 20 or 30 people would come. When I saw about 400 plus people online, I was going to scarper off and not do it because I was terrified, I thought, but uh, I managed. And um, I got an email via Jamie, your colleague, and she said, Dr. Uh, Prof. Cynthia would like to, you know, um, catch up with you because of, I think, a palliative a care conference that is coming up and she was the, either the president or someone running it and she would like me to speak. And so we had a few exchange of emails and because we weren't allowed to do cross cluster, um, have interactions in person, we sort of postponed it. And then it was going to be after Christmas, after Chinese New Year, that sort of thing. And um, just now when I heard she passed on, it sort of like, a punch in the stomach. So I'm so sorry, um, you know, that has happened. And um, well, I just wanted to express uh, a little bit of um, sort of sympathy wouldn't be the right word, but my, my thoughts are with you, Lalit. Thank you. So if um, I, is, does anyone, 
have any questions for me at this stage, just out of curiosity, because I'm a little bit of an oddball, so I don't fit into the entire program completely. Does anyone have any questions for me? No? So I'll do the boring thing and go to my slides then. All right? Okay. So um, I'm actually going to talk a little bit about the cognitive benefits of the arts and humanities, but as you can imagine, it does not just apply to healthcare professionals. I would say it applies to everyone in general. Um, so I think this is a quote that was attributed to the CEO of Twitter, Jack Dorsey. He said that life happens at intersections. And in this particular case, it was said earlier on that a lot of um, emphasis is placed on the clinical aspects of learning. And um, with medical students, and I've had the same experience, it's quite enjoyable and easy um, teaching or delving into the humanities and the arts, but at, at a postgraduate level, I do agree with you that it's a little bit difficult. And the reason I feel is quite a lot of the time, people segregate and compartmentalize things, but life isn't just that. Life is complex, messy, unpredictable, and a lot of it happens at intersections, including the arts, the humanities, the sciences, and everything else around it in our environment. So in my case, um, I trained as a scientist, but uh, from a very young age, completely enjoyed everything to do with the arts, as well as things that were not sort of uh, common and um, I have, I think, my parents to thank for it. So today's presentation is about lived experiences as well as vicarious, obviously through books and a lot of stories that have come my way. Um, Mid-career, I had the opportunity to move to Rome. And uh, this picture where you can see the uh, Castel Sant'Angelo with St. Peter's and the various hills. And again, if you talk about intersections, Rome with its Roman and pre-Roman culture right through the Renaissance up to today, um, whether it's the arts, music, uh, plays and architecture, obviously, um, was something that I completely enjoyed and, and, and learned. Um, from a scientist point of view, um, I actually learned Italian and was able to appreciate whether it was Dante or Goldini and the various plays that were going on. And um, I, after having, you know, done that, um, we went back um, to France for a bit and um, again, uh, learning of French when I was a postgraduate student, um, living there for many, many years, having had my three children there. Um, again, uh, this picture is just about intersections, very rich as far as the arts were concerned, and uh, the various historical events and philosophical um, leanings and um, tendencies when we think of the French Revolution and everything that came about. And then we went to live in Vienna, Austria for about five years and that's when I managed to pick up German. Um, a lot of music as you can imagine whether it was Schubert or Mozart, uh, Bojach, but the highlight of winter would have been for the six months a lot of balls and music and dressing up 
So culturally, that was also some sort of influence in how I see the world and how I teach and how I interact with people. Um, London, again, and West End, obviously, um, just now during the pause, the young lady spoke about her appreciation of, I think, uh, musicals. Yeah. So again, a lot of exposure, um, a lot of joy in that. And then settling back to Lyon this time after Parisian experiences. And Lyon is actually, apart from being a gastro gastronomical um, center with a lot of uh, vineyards around it, it is also the birthplace of cinematography with the uh, Lumiere brothers. So uh, that the, what they call the moving pictures or the cinema was also very prominent and a lot um, spoken about and appreciated. From there, we go to speak about the arts. And in this case, um, a short sort of like simple definition, the arts may prime our neural circuitry for a broader range of activities, boosting crucial cognitive and social skills, spoken and written language, focus, self-control and empathy. I mention empathy specifically um, because I think it was, I can't remember if it was Inkun or Tanya or maybe perhaps both who mentioned it earlier on that um, the levels of empathy tend to decrease after perhaps a third year of uh, medical school when they embark on um, the clinical years and many actually make fun of it and call them the cynical years rather than the clinical years. And um, if we look at the performing and visual arts, the prominent ones would be, you know, a dance and music and then painting and drama as well. So just hold those thoughts. Um, those, those were devices that we've been using whilst we teach our students. Again, with the arts, the way we think, um, or the arts and the humanities, there's quite often no right or wrong answer. We're invited to give our opinions, our feelings, our thoughts, um, without actually having them prescribed into a binary right or wrong. Um, this is a piece by René Magritte, who actually paints a pipe, but beneath it says, um, this is not a pipe. Um, he was Belgian, so he obviously wrote it in French. Ceci n'est pas une pipe. So that is one of um, the advantages of having no right or wrong, but having lots of various uh, inputs and thoughts. So a little bit more didactic here, where I I'd like to believe that the arts and the humanities foster the five C's. The first being critical thinking, um, the product of that thinking. So if you sort of consider that good thinking, and the process, thinking well, sort of results in good thinking skills. And the dictionary definitions also encompass critical thinking as having the ability to judge a form of skepticism. You don't have to believe everything you see, hear or read. And as a simple sort of originality, as sensitive readings, rationality, as well as activist engagement with knowledge. And um, this was said earlier on in various presentations, self-reflexivity, as well as, I suppose, a form of um, reflection to go with that. The next C would be creating meaning. Um, and as I mentioned earlier on, being pestered at nine o'clock in the morning to do this um, IT module thing had absolutely no meaning to me and it was uh, quite a waste of time but I know um, sometimes we can't always do what we want to do and we have to do what 
is required of us. So having that, um, I find that in the arts and the humanities, helping us create meaning, make sense of things that are either difficult, um, in the case of what um, Lalit and Min were talking about, death and dying, those are one of the subsections of our teaching as well. Um, creating meaning in things that are difficult, uh, seem senseless, um, don't actually want to actually engage or have to deal with them, but uh, it's, it's important that these various devices um, in the arts and humanities help us in that, in the everyday work that we do. Curiosity, um, quite a lot of the time, we stay in our comfort zones because we're either scared or not comfortable. Um, and with that, I will speak a little bit about vulnerability later on um, that comes to the fore when we think of the humanities. The next C obviously is creativity. Um, no, um, no doubt about it, whether it's music or philosophy or any of these um, subjects that we're not often exposed to. Next is the last C is conceptualization. And this is, again, the act or process of forming a general notion or idea. And we are each form thoughts in different ways because we've got different backgrounds uh, and ways of training that are quite different. And the individual way in which knowledge is organized in the per particular person's mind. So the next slide, who do you think these two? two persons are. Uh, would, would anyone like to type in the chat? Anybody? Yes, that's right. Da Vinci on the left. And who do you think the lady on the right is? More clues. What do they have in common? Most, both are polymaths and what one would consider a Renaissance man, a uh, man used in the universal term. She's uh, Marie Curie originally Polish, came to France, married Pierre Curie, um, and went on to win two Nobel Prizes. And these people tend to have a lot going for them. They're very good in the sciences, but they're also very curious and very good in other fields that require different sorts of um, skills and thinking in the arts and in the humanities. And Marie Curie actually said that in, in her work as a researcher, one had to dream, yeah? Humanity also needs dreamers for whom the disinterested development of an enterprise is so captivating that it becomes impossible for them to devote their care to their own material profit. So coming back to the humanities, very simple um, uh, constructs. Humanities essentially was a study of human society and culture. Um, again, that dichotomy is not entirely so straightforward and clear cut. People would like to think it's very different from the physical sciences or, and the biological or life sciences. The other um, defining thing is that social sciences originated, which is part of the humanities in the 19th century, but the study of the humanities goes way back to the ancient times. One would think of the Greeks and Romans, but uh, obviously if you include the um, Asian civilizations as well that are extremely um, ancient, that would you know, qualify as well. And the humanities would then encompass various 
sub subjects under that that would be philosophy ancient and modern languages literature history archaeology anthropology human geography law religion and art and um, i'm sure there are more i didn't want to put that much on the slide and why is this particularly important to healthcare? in the sense that we um i i teach communications as well um and uh, i remember have having to battle through this because most times people would say um we we already communicate we're fine with communication there's no need to have you know this this sort of um courses or improve on these skills um but to, to be able to communicate effectively, work independently and in teams and interpret into information, a lot of it um, is fostered and bolstered, I would say, from actually delving into the arts and the humanities. And we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. As individual healthcare workers, um, you know, the skills can be developed but also for the entire faculty, if we are looking at that, what could be improved would be their attention. And um, these are all part of the cognitive skills that we're looking at, the actual learning and memory by inviting the arts and humanities into our curriculum. We'd have more empathetic workers that are more resilient to burnout um, and are holistically oriented rather than um say pigeonholed and thinking i don't like the word out of the box but um like we said earlier on where there are intersections far more things happening than in a particular domain or category and empathy obviously um you know, when I watched, uh, re-watched Wit when Tanya was presenting earlier on and um, thinking about all that, um, one can't deny that watching films or drama or snippets or listening to music um, is, is or, or appreciating art for that matter or sculpture um, is, is very helpful in um enhancing our skills in empathy in perspective taking where we walk in another shoe in another's shoes process emotions and imagine a more hopeful future which is very important especially in the work that we do um there is a museum uh that is the empathy museum where you actually have shoes of holocaust victims and when you put those shoes on uh don't ask me if they don't if what happens if they don't fit but i'm assuming they're sort of largest shoes um you can put on a set of headphones and walk around in those shoes and when you listen in it'll be telling you about the person who actually owned those shoes um, during the Second World War and their life stories. And I thought that was quite a nice touch. Um, so if you ever get a chance to go to the Empathy Museum, you could do something like that. Um, earlier on, I talked about vulnerability. And uh, I think it is one of the um, most poignant and beautiful things about um, exploring the arts and the humanities with our students and it's a time when we each talk about our we tell our stories um, if we fe feel psychologically safe and uh, we divulge more things that we normally wouldn't um, and we explore our emotions feelings and that regulation that space in between as well um often it's quite difficult to talk about the three d's disease disability and death and now you know we're paying more attention um especially in our family medicine curricula 
where we are looking at the social determinants of health because quite often um, they were ignored and we treated each one um, equally or the same without actually knowing what their stories and uh, where they live, what they do, what are their circumstances. And they, these are extremely important um, and we're doing it more and more now, uh, much aided by the study of the arts and the humanities in healthcare. And um, I forgot to mention ICU because it was said earlier on, but uh, definitely palliative care, family medicine, gerontology, study of aging, things that sort of um, are not so often spoken of, especially when we are young, we forget that, you know, one day we won't be so young. So it's good to be able to um, explore these, these topics um, more, more deeply. So on the arts and humanities and medical education, the same um, things come back in that we try and use it so that people are better able to cope and in coping they mean resilience against burnout um, in the work that they do and to instill some form of humanism um, if it is eroded or lost and then definitely um, try and enhance or at least preserve what empathy um, you know it, the remnants of it if it's starting to uh, decrease or be lost. Abraham Flexner, um, as you all know, was, you know, the father of um, medical education at that time, um, just after the, the, the depression in the US. And he said that a, a quote of his would be, he wanted people to pursue useless knowledge. Um, Flexner was, if we look at his own life, he was a son of East European Jewish immigrants. One, I think the youngest son of nine in a family, they were extremely poor um, at the time. And his father was an itinerant salesman. At some point in his life, he was selling hats as well. And um, everything was sort of, you know, not, not very cushy or, or comfortable in their lives when they were growing up. And that changed later on. But he did say um, that this quote, I have spoken of experimental science, but what I say is equally true of music and art and of every other expression of the untrammeled human spirit. The mere fact that they bring satisfaction to an individual soul bent upon its own purification and elevation is all the justification that they need. So in this sense, bringing satisfaction and elevation is, is more than enough. Another person, um, Théophile Gauthier, um, he said that art for the sake of art was enough. So at that time um, in the 19th century, 1800s, they, they sort of um, proposed that there was no reason to have a reason for art. In um, the years that I've been working at NUHS and NUS, I've had the privilege of working with the third spacing team, as many of you probably have as well. I know Dave has. Um, and they're a lovely bunch of medical students, I think about to graduate or graduating this year. Um, and they ran a series, the most, I suppose, prominent work that they were doing was a series of podcasts and uh, Miss Ching uh, An Hui was sort of the originator of this. She spent I think a year or slightly more maybe 18 months at Yale um, in the States and she brought back with her uh, a lot of enthusiasm and uh, her love for the arts and the humanities and it all came up in the work with producing these various podcasts. In the realm of podcasts, there's been quite a lot um, done, um, most of it coming from North America. Um, and a few, if you are curious and would like to delve into them in the healthcare um, sector would be these podcasts, 
Human Side in Healthcare, Conversations for Arts, Humanities and Health, one by the BMJ, which is called Medical Humanities, quite simply, and Health Humanities um, from Chapel Hill. Um, I think that would be um, North Carolina. Someone spoke about authors, healthcare or doctors writing books, and um, I had compiled a few. And in my teachings, we encourage our students or learners to read at least excerpts, if not the entire book. Uh, sometimes, you know, it gets a bit heavy going for them if they've got loads of other assignments to hand up. But I was also desperately looking for nurses stories and found one that I, I liked and would like to encourage you all to read The Language of Kindness by Christy Watson. Um, again, in the world of writing um, where, where, you know, the list on the left is physicians, I didn't find that many women that were writing. I don't know whether they, I doubted that they, it, they were not inspired, but perhaps um, we would like to see more of women clinicians having the time to write and delve into this, you know, exciting work apart from their um, clinical work. Yeah, I'm just going to let you enjoy um, this poem. Uh, you may actually already know it. It's by Alison Mosquera, and she writes simply about the drug tamoxifen. My doctor's given me a massive can of elephant repellent. I'm to spray it after washing on my skin. It will substantially reduce the risk, he says, of being trampled by an elephant in Savile Row, the side or Granger Street. I'm terrified of elephants, of course, but never have I seen one roam the streets of Tyneside. That's the point, my doctor says, as if their absence proves the potency of elephant repellent. Problem is, the sprays are vivid blue and permanent, so I'd be branded like some miscreant. My only crime susceptibility to elephant advances. Worst of all, I won't be able to forget my plight. And how can I be sure the spray will work? And how long must I use the wretched stuff? Five years, that long. What choices do I have? I spray and hope and bear the mark or risk, the onslaught of an errant elephant one unsuspecting day. Well, thank you, Doc, but no, I won't be cowed. My life's too short to waste in fear. Five years is far too long. The benefit does not outweigh the risk. Instead, I'll stride out blithely every day. And if by chance I meet an elephant, perhaps I'll have some peanuts in my bag. And as it's said that they cannot resist the taste of nuts, well, maybe I'll survive. Um, I'm going to stop share just for a little while here and ask you what you think of the metaphor of the elephant and that poem if you'd like to make any comments. Has anyone here already read it? Oh, I can see a message from Janet. Daniel, Daniel Offrey's book, pub. yes, that's right. Um, what Doctors Feel, I think, um, was one of the ones that I read. Yes, thank you very much, Janet. Comments about the elephant? and the blue spray. No? Not um, even among our palliative care physicians here today. 
I think it's a wonderful poem. Hello, I'm Giskin. I'm, I'm actually speaking for the next session, but I'm so pleased I managed to join a bit early because uh, I'm really enjoying this. Um, I, I mean, it's such a wonderful poem, isn't it, about um, the, uh, yeah, weighing up those choices we have. It did may, make me think a little bit of Djokovic, though, and uh, him exercising his choice not to uh, have a vaccine. Um, uh, and uh, and the difference really with that uh, the, the poem um, that you've just read uh, and per and personal responsibility and social responsibility um, and how it's lovely to celebrate autonomy of choice uh, or making choices in treatment and choosing treatment or choosing not to have treatment and how that's um, a hallmark of um, an enlightened society in which people have autonomy and but how different it may have been if that um, purple spray was uh, to protect against COVID, say, and how we might have different attitudes to it. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's what it made me think of. <laughs> Thank you very much, Giskin. Um, yeah, I agree. It does make one think of Djokovic. However, maybe in the public health realm, cancer is not an infectious disease, whereas in his case, um, he's bound by other rules and regulations, I suppose, from a public health point of view. Yeah, thank you very much. I should have you in class with me. <laughs> Be very, very enlightening and very fun. Um, the next piece I'd like to go to is um, something that I use with um, some, some of our learners and our participants. It's actually um, four minutes long. So it might be a, a time in, um, and can, can I check till what time do, do am, I, am I speaking today? Till four. Till four o'clock. Yeah. Okay, so that I can you know, manage the time and, and not um, tax everyone. I thought at this juncture it could be a, um, quite uplifting and maybe relaxing to hear this. Um, the, um, it's just a different rendition and you might actually know it. It's a, a group called Pentatonics and they are going to, they're singing Hallelujah. They do other songs as well, but it's often a uh, penta as, as one would imagine five singers. And um, I'll let you enjoy this. Let me read what's been written in the chat was trying to reread the poem, but I do think it describes the trepidation that patients have about therapy, therapies that we think is good and ought to be taken, no brainer. Yes, that's right. And that's why the question of autonomy is there. And I know the references to Savile Row and things like that, it's just very, very London-like, very British, um, where the tailors are. But I suppose we could have um, similar, you know, references if we think of other big cities where you know the the main streets the high streets and and where uh fashion is uh, in this case you know where the tailors the the top tailors reside thank you very much natalie so i'll let you enjoy this piece and then you you can you know either add something if you want to say or just appreciate it quietly in a meditative state all right um let me Share screen again. Um, so that, that short interlude for, for you to rest a little bit and enjoy the music. Very different from the original version by Leonard Cohen when he wrote it with his guitar. And um, I suppose the comments that the, chil the, the children, sorry, the students came up with was um, they realised that for, for the appeal of that particular rendition, it also was, um, you know, politically correct and it had representation um, from, from various ethnic groups and men, women. And then 
the gentlemen with the very high falsetto voice, they were very impressed by that. And they were actually, you know, asking more questions and wondering how, you know, one comes up with works of art that um, defy things that are conventional, things that we actually um, take to be the norm. Yeah. So we were questioning um, not just the, the song itself the, or, or the presentation of it, but um, how it was pieced together. And so that's that's what it invited as thoughts and um, comments from from the learners. I'll go back to share screen and here and continue. So I um, was very interested in Monet's work or much of the Impressionist work and hadn't visited Giverny. And when I did go, um, lo and behold, the real thing was just like the painting. So sometimes things that are represented in art are um, an allegory or something that is not uh, represented as it is. And sometimes it is what, what you see is exactly what is. So that too is something that we can play around with when we look at art uh, or appreciate any form of art. The last part, um, I'm going to just talk about the, um, when we talk about performing arts, I'm going to choose just one on dance and how it impacts positively cognitive reserve, which is actually um, what, how, how your brain ages and how it can be slowed down. And in this case, neuroplasticity, which is improved um, through dancing. And one of the quotes in this paper um, from Nature, a prospective 21 year study demonstrated that regular participation in dancing was the only physical activity amongst the 11 studied, whether it's bicycling, playing tennis or swimming, um, and several others because they mention 11, that was associated with a lower risk of dementia in an elderly cohort, presumably by increasing plasticity and cognitive reserve. And the reason I say that is um, I am going to be vulnerable here and say that um, one of the activities I took up last year is something I've never done before, um, which was learning samba, which is a Brazilian dance, yeah? And it's very rhythmic. Um, you can imagine that the um, migrants from Africa uh, arriving on the South American continent, bringing their music, um, their earthy beats, and obviously the dance. So since life in general and in our work, pain and suffering, death and dying, and all the things that are very raw sometimes, um, I thought I'd be vulnerable myself and share with you um, the, the, um, the little dance that our teacher got us to do when she got us all dressed up. And then, you know, probably end my presentation here having made a complete fool of myself, but that's all right. So um, since, since I'm talking so much about the arts, um, I might as well uh, put my money where my mouth is. Uh, can can you all see this? Uh, can can you all see the share screen at the moment? No, not yet. Not yet. No. Oh, okay. Maybe I'm not allowed to be vulnerable. Let me see. Let me <laughs> let me try again, huh? Is this okay? Can you see now? Yes. Okay. Ready? And five, six, seven, eight, and one, two.
So, um, learning something for the new first time and being silly is, is fine. Um, I'll end it here with the last part of the presentation. Where, so in all this, what do we seek to understand, right? Pain and suffering, death and dying, but at the same time, there's a lot of beauty and making meaning of things that are quite unfair, senseless, uh, painful sometimes that we have to go through. And uh, I'd like to end with this little sculpture here. Whilst living in Rome, we were just a few minutes from what we, was known as the Villa Borghese, because this was a huge sort of garden, plus the museum uh, in there, where we had sculptures uh, by Bernini that were so lifelike. Um, I don't know how he managed to create skin and hair and trees out of stone and marble. It was just quite amazing. So I thought I'd end my presentation with a little slide on um, a little museum that I used to go to often on my way to work and back whilst I was living in Rome um, called the Borghese Museum. Um, I, if you like, um, I can take some questions now. I hope I've sort of not overrun. Um, and um, yes. Hi, hi, Melina. So, you, you don't mind? I'm just going to ask a, a practical question. Just thank yes. you, thank you for the presentation. I, I'm just wondering um, because most of the um, so far, a lot of the things that were discussed, uh, things like visual arts and and the stuff that you have presented, uh, mm -hmm. they cater to a, a, a certain group of people. Because um, okay, I'm just let's say I talk to myself. I'm a, I'm a cultural baboon, right? So I I, I watch sports my entire life, and I have absolutely no idea of some of the I can't appreciate the beauty of some of the things you show, which I'm sure they are beautiful in in their own ways. But I, I look at it, I'm like I'm trying really hard. To, to, to appreciate it, but I can't because it's just not within my DNA, I think, right? And, and I'm not sure with, I, I mean, I'm pretty sure there's quite a few of people like me out there as well, especially the guys. Maybe the ladies are a, bit, are a lot more cultured than guys, but guys are, are monkeys to begin with, right? And, and we, we, it takes us a, to a different level when we explore these things. So how do you cater for a larger group of um, students, doctors who may not find the relevance or, or struggle to actually appreciate some of these things. I mean, you try and get them to appreciate it or do you have different ways of uh, engaging them? I, I think, um, Andrew, what, what you said is entirely true. And these are the challenges I do face. I don't think it's um, a lack of appreciation on your part or anyone else because these is sort of like, cultural references that are very European in that sense, because I did live and work 30 years in several countries in Europe. But again, I suppose what speaks to people, and when I asked students, um, they came up with Korean drama, with um, scenes and situations that were more uh, closer to what they know in Asia, um, with um, stories in a medical setting, um, and liking sports is actually uh, invigorating. I think it's it's a it's something. Uh, if we go to passions and hobbies and things like that, um, friends of mine that do skydiving and all that sort of thing, um, there's a certain exhilaration sometimes, a certain loneliness where we need to contemplate. Uh, I'm a long distance runner, definitely. There's a lot of meditation going on when they're just in that flow of running for the sake of running and, and you know, putting one foot in front of the other in spite of all the pain. Uh, I think there is um, beauty and art in that. Um, it's just we, we probably don't see it and quantify it when we have that sort of lived experience because we think culture or being cultured or civilized is sitting in the Lascaux caves and looking at the bison and going, oh, those are wonderful strokes. And I can see, you know, the carbon um, dating goes back to this and that. And it also sounds very hoity-toity and clever. 
And um, believe it or not, I was a middle school as well as international baccalaureate teacher for a few years in, I think in the 2000s. And um, one year I was given, I was a homeroom teacher and I was given this class of, um, I would say, 14 year olds, the 14, 15 year olds. And I was going through Hamlet and uh, I was ready to slit my veins because I thought, oh my God, all these pubescent boys and girls, they'll never, I'll not survive Hamlet. They won't survive Hamlet. I think on the second lesson, I asked them, I said, you know, does this sort of remind you of any Disney story? And um, it was an international French school. There are many in the world. So my name was actually Madame. So I wasn't actually running a brothel, but you know, anyone who has the, carries the name Madame sounds very... <laughs> and uh, they called me Madame. Uh, yes. Um, the Lion King. And I said, how so? And they said, well, you know, uh, Mufasa was killed by that brother who then married his wife and then, you know, poor Simba. And I said, oh, yeah. And from that moment on, um, the rest of the pages of Hamlet went on really well because their cultural reference was obviously not Shakespeare, but it was Walt Disney. And there was nothing higher or lower or I suppose more noble than Shakespeare but uh, it didn't matter because that that I thought was the beauty of how one hears stories the narratives and uh, what meaning sense and relevance it has to each one of us is quite different and because their reference was something else it didn't mean they couldn't then transpose that to the boring Shakespearean Hamlet they had to go through and sit tests for if you see what I mean um we, we can sort of make meaning and enjoy something or, or completely not enjoy something so when I run my my uh, mindfulness sessions People tell me there's nothing worse than that. It's actually mindlessness. And they say, the last thing I want is to be in touch with my thoughts and my body. Please let me get away. I need to escape. This is horrible stuff. And I, I, I take it and I say, yeah, sure. It's thank you for being so honest. You don't have to actually like what I like or appreciate what I appreciate in the same way, I think. And um Knowing what we don't like in life is probably the most important thing because then we can do the stuff or appreciate the stuff that we like um, and reorientate ourselves. I think Graham has a comment or question. Hi, um, can you hear me okay? I'm not sure if the mic's yes. working, all right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, fortunately, the foggers have departed and uh, the sky is clear again. Um, thank you so much for, for all the presentations. I found them really fascinating. Uh, I really in, uh, was really uh, very interested in the work that, that Lali and Min are doing. It's really good to see uh, the ways in which they're collecting these uh, narratives and these stories and then uh, close reading them effectively and, and finding out new ways in. Uh, and I really enjoyed uh, Melina's talk as well, uh, which I think gives us really interesting insights into the ways in which um, uh, in which the arts can um, help uh, perhaps to generate greater empathy and greater understanding. Uh, and I, I kind of recognize the kind of issues that, um, that Andrew's uh, raising here. Uh, and I just want to give uh, a little bit of insight into the ways in which uh, a humanity scholar might think a bit differently about uh, the the ways in which we encounter art and and particular with with gender that you talked about just now um, and you mentioned that men like sports and i suppose that women like poetry uh, and this is very much uh, a binarized view of gender that does really not hold true at all uh, i think in in the humanities we often uh, want to deconstruct uh, our understandings of of gender differences 
uh, and that the approach you're taking there is is quite essentialist. Um, the kind of assumption, uh, assumption that boys like blue and, and girls like pink is just frankly untrue. Um, the it's a it's a cultural stereotype that has developed throughout the centuries and. Uh, in the Victorian era, for instance, it was quite standard to dress boys in pink. It's, there's, there's no link to uh, sex or gender there. Uh, and I wonder the thing, one of the things I wanted to sort of point out is that what, what we're doing in universities is not just kind of appreciating art. We're not just saying, oh, that's a pretty thing. Much art is, is, is not uh, beautiful, is not attractive at all. Um, and instead, we're sort of deploying critical thinking, critical reasoning to really uh, get into how these narratives are constructed and what uh, hidden ideologies or submerged ideologies and ideas are, are present there. And I think one of the things that's really, really crucial and a really valuable contribution is the ways in which uh, people in the humanities think about issues to do with race, to do with gender, to do with class, uh, to do with religion, and the ways in which those uh, are uh, consciously or unconsciously impacting uh, doctor-patient communication or the ways in which a, a patient is um, trying to convey uh, valuable information. The other thing is that uh, in in Western uh, literature and philosophy, this is based on a misreading of Kant. We basically tend to assume that there's a difference between our head and our heart. We assume that there's a, a, a clear binary between intellectual or cognitive reason and what we might call emotional reason. And uh, I think a lot of the time with, with the sciences, we have a tendency to try to shut off emotional reason and focus purely on cognitive reason. Um, and it's, 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 it's something that's, I think has, has caused a, a kind of a, a problem in, in a lot of uh, Western philosophy that we're still to this day trying to understand and correct. Um, and one of the things that I think a lot of us are, are arguing in the medical humanities is that there is actually value in emotional reasoning. Uh, part of the thinking here is that if you, uh, try to detach, if you, if you try to detach completely from your emotions and uh, address issues purely in a, in a cognitive way, um, then you're actually leaving yourself vulnerable. It might work in the short term to, to detach yourself from uh, uh, scenes of suffering, um, but the problem is that you're still going to have those emotions. You're still going to experience emotional responses. It's just that you're going to be less equipped to be able to handle them and to, to recognize them. So if you have a scene where you feel sad or you feel angry or uh, frustrated, surely it's far better to recognize that and to then sit back and process it and, and, uh, uh, and identify it and think about, well, why do I feel frustrated? Why do I feel angry? Rather than just trying to, to repress the emotional side. Um, and I think it, it comes through when we're doing um, literary studies, when we're looking at a poem, we're not just saying this is a beautiful poem. We are, uh, uh, we're also, um, engaging both our cognitive skills uh, as well as our emotional skills. So we're thinking about, okay, this poem makes me feel, feel in a particular way or it's stimulating these kinds of emotions. How is it doing it? How is it constructing it? How is it being put together? Um, and uh, I imagine Giskin, who's, who's on later, is going to talk a bit more uh, about these kinds of skills of close reading. But I just wanted to say that in the humanities, we're, we're not just kind of fluffy and we're not just... Um, kind of hoity-toity or blah, blah, blah. We're actually engaged with very real um, uh, issues that, that have a very direct impact on, on how we process information, how we talk to each other and how we communicate. Um, yeah. Thanks, uh, Graham. I do recognize that we are a bit uh, over time. Um, may I have the last word? <laughs> um, I. If there's still any doubt, uh, I must say, uh, Marina, the, the talk was entirely appropriate. Uh, in fact, I learned a lot and I must thank you for, for being very generous and sharing your vulnerability. Um, I can't imagine uh, the video clip, uh, is it password protected and locked away in some, <laughs> some part of your house? <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and I think it was very powerful because uh, what you did was actually to demonstrate what it was like as a faculty member who actually engages in the art and music, in arts and music. Um, and it's not just about doing things, planning program. It is also important to uh, have an understanding about our own personal approach and views regarding the humanities. Yeah, so, so if you... Um, yeah, I think the programs so far these two days have been planned such that there, are, there is a lot of information, definitely. There's a lot of, uh, you know, lesson planning, a lot of uh, program sharing. 
Uh, but what uh, Melina you shared it is really something um, equally important, if not more important as well. So, so really, thank you very much. Uh, definitely will invite you again if we have such a, a shot. <laughs> so no worries about that at all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.